key thing for today is, is how to win in 2022. So 2021 was a great year for markets. In 2022, there are going to be a lot of changes, a lot more volatility than we're used to. So I want to talk a lot about that. So the first thing I want to talk about is winning, right? So we define winning as we talk to our clients about not losing and minimizing losses as much as possible, right? So the key thing is, is if you're down 10%, you have to make back 11% just to get the break, just to break even versus if you're down 50%, you got to be up 100% just to get back to even. So when you think about the clients that I serve are clients that have built their wealth over 20, 30 years, sold a business, or just did a great job building their wealth. So they can't afford to be down 50% and wait to get back to even because that could take multiple years because they can't go back and repeat what they just accomplished. So that's why it's really important that the clients that, that I serve to help protect the downside as much as we possibly can and get a respectable rate of return on the upside to, so they can be able to achieve the vision that they have for their life. So one way you win is by minimizing losses. So that's really important thing to know, number one. So the first thing I wanna talk about is inflation concerns. So what I've been very vocal about last year, whether it's on media with CNBC, Bloomberg, or anything, any articles that I've written and talked about, it's all been on the idea that inflation is not transitory. And finally, the Federal Reserve admitted it last year that that's not going to be the case. In fact, it may be even more persistent than they thought. And that's why the Federal Reserve got more hawkish, meaning that they're going to start moving forward in raising interest rates and at the same token, stop buying bonds like they've been doing every single month. So we're going from a very loose type of environment where the Federal Reserve was injecting capital into the economy, buying up bonds, supporting markets, right? And fiscal policy where the government sent money to consumers to help support them during COVID to the complete opposite type of environment. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a big shift that we're gonna see in 22 that's gonna create a lot of volatility. So what do we do about this inflation concern, right? So the first thing I want you to understand is, is why do we have inflation? The reason why we have inflation, as I've been saying, is when you shut down the whole world, essentially, and like we did in March of 2020, and you start to reopen, and you have the COVID mitigation steps, such as social distancing, et cetera, and then you have an injection of capital that comes into an economy that consumers start spending, creating demand, that's when you have a shift where there's a supply and demand issue. And that's one of the reasons that we're seeing prices rise like we've been seeing. So when we look at inflation, just today was a CPI print, which prints 7%. Before today in December, the last print, it was 6.81%. So we haven't seen inflation numbers like this over, since, over the past 40 years. Right, so we haven't seen numbers like we're seeing today since back in 1982, the 1982 period. So the, the, the specific inflation that, that concerns me is one, wages rising. When you have wages rising within corporations, they pass that on to their products, which essentially gets passed on to us, the consumer. So wages going up, which also affects corporate earnings is a big part of, of the inflation that we're looking at. The second part is shelter. So shelter costs we've seen go up 3.66% over the past 12 months. Again, a direct hit to the consumer. If you look at the, 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 the price of oil, the price of oil has risen to $84.57 from just above $20 from 2020. Again, a direct tax on the consumer. And then finally, the price of food. The price of food has gone up 5.6%. It's actually gone up 6% now after today's print over the past 12 months. So when you think about shelter, food, energy costs, wages, these are all direct hits to the consumer, direct tax on the consumer, especially on the low income thresholds. So inflation is for real, inflation is going to be persistent. So as we think about inflation, what, why do we care about inflation is the next question. So when I think about the clients that I serve, there are clients that are 50, 55, 60 years old, 65 years old, maybe even 70 years old. So there's a good chance if you're 65 years old, there's a 50% chance that you could live to 86 if you're, a, if you're a man, 88 years old if you're a woman. And if you're married, one of you has a 50% chance of living to 92 years old. So if you're 65 years old today, there's a high probability that you will live another 20 plus years. 
living another 20 plus years, as you think about the math of that, when you think about inflation, that means that whatever you're spending today with an average inflation rate of 3%, you're going to need, if you're spending $100,000, you're going to need $200,000 in, in 17 years from now. And then if you live another 17 years from now, you're going to need $400,000. So this is the biggest concern. Someone who especially who stops working, who no longer has an income coming in, is this idea of whatever you're spending today, how this will increase down the road. And when you think about that increase, just going back to where we are with inflation. So if today we're at inflation of 7%, I'm not suggesting that's going to be the inflation on average the next 20 years, 30 years, but it probably will be higher than what we've experienced the past 15 years. So maybe now the level of income that you're spending today can possibly double your need over the next 13 years, 14 years. And so this is the major concern that the clients we serve and as I think about them today as it relates to inflation. So th that's why we're concerned about inflation in terms of what our costs are day to day. As we think about so now, so, so we, we understand why there's inflation. We understand why we care about inflation. Now, how does it, how do, so what does it mean in terms of investing your capital? The first issue I have is when I talk to a lot of clients and even prospective clients, friends, family members, and a lot of them come up to me who have a lot of money in the bank and they're asking me, Phil, when is the market going to crash? Phil, when's the market going to crash? And they've been asking me this question over the past three years. And the answer is exactly the same. I have no idea. Nobody knows. It's not something you could try to forecast or predict. And if you think about that, over the past three years, the returns of a balanced portfolio has averaged anywhere from 6 to 10% to maybe even 12%. Over a three-year period, that's a lot of money you lost out on because you left your money in cash. And when you think about cash, when you think about cash, since 1926 to 2020, which is a good timeline to look at, it, cash on average returned 3.3%. When you factor in average inflation, over the, play, over the past 90 plus years, your return is actually 0.4%. So you, was, you were able to stay ahead of inflation somewhat based on where history was in terms of cash returns and after inflation numbers. When you think about today specifically, right? If you take, if you take today, you're earning in the bank somewhere around 0 0.10 to maybe 0.20%. When you factor in a 7% inflation number, you're talking about your real return on your, on your actual cash is anywhere from negative 6.80 to negative not 6.90%. That translates into, you, if you have a million dollars in the bank today, in 12, 13, 14 years, that million dollars, the value of that million dollars will be zero. So that's the importance of, of putting the money to work and investing into a, a, I'm not saying you take all your money, put it into the stock market. You could dollar cost average into the markets. You can build a balanced portfolio, which I'll talk more about in a moment. But keeping money in the cash is a sure loser. I always advise you should have no more than 12 months worth of expenses in the bank. The rest should be fully invested. Unless you have a wedding to pay for, maybe college for your, your, your children or grandchildren. So if there's, some, if there's an event that you need to spend under three years, then that extra money you leave in the bank, and I understand, and even though you're losing there, there really is no choice because you need access to that capital. But no more than 12 months expenses, expenses in the bank is perfectly fine. How about, how about bond-related investments? And this is really interesting. So if you look at over the short term, so this is short-term rates, so the two-year treasury bond. So the two-year treasury bond over the past three months has risen 171%. So it went from 0.32% to 0.86% today. So short-term rates went up a lot because they're anticipating the Federal Reserve increase in the Fed fund rate and that's why the short end has gone up. A lot of investors bought short-term bonds because they were scared that long-term bonds were going to go up. So there was a tremendous amount of buying in the short-term part, the short end of the yield curve, right, which brought those prices up to levels you've seen. So if you own bonds five years or less, sell them because there's no value in those bonds today. Now, you may say to yourself, well, okay, the short end of the yield curve, right, has increased why hasn't the long end of the bond market increased? Why hasn't the long end of the bond market increased? If you look over the last three months, the long end, actually the longest 30-year treasury bond is actually down 2.31%. And why would that be? 
So the bond market is a lot smarter than the stock market. The bond market either doesn't believe that inflation is going to be persistent or they don't believe that the economy is going to continue to grow. Or they believe that Fed Powell will make a mistake. He'll make a policy mistake where he'll be too aggressive in tightening the economy and which would cause a short term or even a somewhat intermediate term recession, which would drive the long end down. So that's what the bond market is believing right now. So if you're a bond investor, I'm not too concerned in looking at where the, the long end of the interest rate uh, curve is today. But that can change, obviously, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not as concerned. That's number one. Number two, should you own bonds in your portfolio? I get this question a lot. And the short answer is absolutely yes, 1,000%. Is it a great is a great investment returning asset class over the next 10 years? Probably not. And we'll talk more about that. But what bonds do, do what bonds do for you as an investor, it helps protect your portfolio when stocks go down. When stocks go down, right, bonds help provide a cushion and move the opposite way. I've talked a lot about when one, one asset class zigs, the other asset class zags. So the purpose of, a, of owning bonds in your portfolio is to give you protection when you go through down periods. So there is a purpose. So to get out of bonds completely and go into stocks is risk that you can't handle, number one. Number two, if you leave your money in cash at 0.10 versus putting your money into some type of bond-related investments that's giving you maybe tax-free income of 2% or 3%, right, is a, is, a, is a heck of a lot better than staying at 0.10%. So that's where we are on the bond market. So what is the bottom line with inflation as it relates to investing your capital? And where should you be putting your money when, you go, when, you go, when you're in an, infl in an inflation accelerating environment? Well, I'm always a big believer as a student of the market is let's look at the history of the markets. Let's understand when there were inflationary periods or in, where interest rates were rising and what were the best performing asset classes. When you look at the data going back now from, 19 to, from 1968 to 2021, the best performing asset classes were gold and commodities. So the best performing asset classes were gold and was commodities. So when it comes to inflation concerns, which is topic number one, where you want to be invested within your portfolio or have exposure to is gold and commodities. And if you look at where gold and commodities, think about commodities last year, commodities were up 30, 35%, depending on what you owned. So, so inflation accelerated, so commodities performed well. Gold had a little bit of a challenging time because you could say that gold is tied to the dollar and tied to interest rates, but now you're starting to see gold starting to break out. And we talked a little bit about that in our newsletter on Saturday. So gold and commodities are two asset classes that perform well when inflation accelerates. The other question I get, well, Phil, what percentage of my portfolio should I have in gold and commodities? And that really depends on how much risk that you want to handle. The way we look at it is, the way we look at it as a firm is gold and commodities has a lot of risk. In other words, they move a lot up and down. So if you take all of your money and put it in, split it between two, I wouldn't advise that. The way we construct a portfolio within our firm is we decide within our clients how much, how much stocks and bonds they want to have. So let's say 50% is in, is in stocks and let's say 50% is in bond-related investments. What we do is we move 7.5% and 7.5% split between gold and commodities. So that's how we manage the, the risk and the return profile within our portfolios, which we think makes sense, you know, that specific number. So that's inflation concerns. The, the other part in terms of gold and commodities is, so we studied every time the Fed tightened, how did certain asset classes perform? Every time the Fed has tightened, this is going back from 1972 to December, 2020, when the Fed tightens, commodities and gold are both the outperformers relative to the other asset classes. So again, more proof and, and being a student of the market, when you look at the history of, of how certain things perform, when you get to a certain type of an environment, gold and commodities tend to still outperform. So the next area is, which has been a huge debate last year is, is growth versus value. And what's the difference between a growth stock? What's the difference between a value stock? And which area is going to outperform which as we think about 2021, which we were talking a lot about, and now going into 2022. 
So first, I want you to understand is what is the difference between a growth stock and a value stock? A growth stock example would be take Tesla. Tesla has done a great job growing sales from $6.9 billion to $16.8 billion over the past five years. Their total profit cumulatively over the past five years has actually been negative $3.792 billion. So they lost money all along the way. Tesla is a great company. Sales have been tremendous. They're going to continue to do well. And the reason why they lost money, which actually now over the past 12 months, they're actually starting to make money finally, is because they've taken a lot of the capital and reinvesting it back into the business through research and development, which is very typical of these growth-oriented companies because they're in the early stages of growing. And that's what investors are betting on. Investors are betting on that Tesla and other growth companies can grow sales by 10, 20, 30% or more over a period of time and eventually become a mature company that will be able to distribute their cash flow to the investor in the form of a dividend or even earnings as well. So you're buying a growth company today with the anticipation of a future cash flow potential that you believe will be true. So that's a growth investment. A value investment is something like, let's take McDonald's. McDonald's over the past five years went from 24 billion down to 19 billion, and that's a lot due to COVID. But they're pretty much steady at no great profit growth like you saw in Tesla, and their overall no great revenue growth rather. But profits, here's the difference, right? Profits were much different. Profits were $26 billion over the past five years. So McDonald's issues a dividend. McDonald's has been around for greater than 50 years. McDonald's, pay, uh, McDonald's is considered a mature company that has stability, predictability, and has really proven themselves over time. So sometimes when you go, when you have different economic, different economic and cycles, economic cycles, and all of a sudden you go from expansionary period with, the, with an economy and then start to hit a peak and now start to move downward, this is where you start to see investors start to move away from growth more into value because they want more predictability because they're not sure how the economy and how bad the economy is going to go down and eventually hit a trough. So, so that's where we are today in terms of the economy. We're in more mid-cycle, maybe even more moving more towards the late cycle. And that's why you're going to see this shift from growth investing to value investing as you think about 22 and, and going forward. But let me just make a few other important points. So in terms of in terms of growth investing, so this shows you there, there, there are periods when growth outperforms value and value outperforms growth. So from 1995 to 2000, growth outperformed value by a wide margin, 357% versus 144%. Then from 2000 to 2013, value outperformed growth. And then from 2013 to 2022, growth has really um, outperformed outperform value, right? So what I'm proving here is that there are periods where growth beats value, value beats growth, and vice versa. The, the key question is, is that over a long period of time, going back since 1970, which is a good amount of data to look at, value has outperformed growth over a longer period of time. And that's why look, investors like Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, how they have such great success and why they're believers in the value strategy, because over time, that is the best strategy. So then the question is, well, Phil, how should I invest in value and growth? And my answer to you is you should start out to be even, Stephen, within your stock portfolio. So in other words, don't bet the house on one versus the other because of what I just showed you from, from a history standpoint. What you can do, like I believe you can do today, is you can overweight one versus the other. So going from 50% in value, increasing that to 60% and decreasing growth to 40% is perfectly fine, right? And perfectly, and perfectly no, I'd be, I would be perfectly comfortable with that. And the same thing where growth becomes of value relative to value, and then you make that shift too. So as growth has done really, really well, what you should, be, should have been doing within your portfolio throughout the years is looking to rebalance, rebalance, rebalance portfolio, bring it back to 50-50. And that helps you to buy certain certain stocks that are cheaper than growth stocks. And then when value has its day, which I believe it's going to, you'll be able to really capitalize on that, which is really important. The other point in terms of value versus growth, when you look at growth today, <clears throat> besides them having a besides growth having an incredible run versus value, 
the valuation of growth, growth today relative to value is very expensive. Here, this is, by, this is produced by Vanguard. So Vanguard is showing you that the valuations of growth investing, US large cap growth is very stretched in terms of valuation. So the returns going forward are not gonna be as optimistic as they were the past 10 years. Where, they're, where you're seeing some fairly value investments is more in the small cap area and more of the large cap area, specific, specifically in small cap. Small cap right now, from a value standpoint, they're trading at a cheaper multiple to, from, to, to large cap area. Their earnings forecast are greater in 22 than they are of large cap. When interest rates rise, small caps tend to outperform. So that's another area within the markets where you can do well. So when it comes to the growth value debate, the growth value debate, right? You can argue that value should have its run. Growth is way overvalued. Balancing between growth and value is important. A little bit more of a tilt towards value in this type of an economy and where we're going makes a lot of sense. The third part to talk to you about to keep us in line from a timing standpoint till 1230 is planning for lower forecasted returns. This is the most important part of this webinar today. What I want you to understand is that going forward, based on where we are, stocks are way extended. We haven't seen stocks extended today since, like this since 2000. And we know what happened after that. If you look at the, the, uh, the CAPE ratio, which this is a lot of people are talking about this, it's really important. So Bob, Robert Schiller had put this together, won a, won a Nobel Peace Prize as a result of it. What he's showing in this diagram here that looks busy, but here's the simple, here's a simple way to understand this. The bottom line is, is based on, we are based on where the markets are trading today from a valuation standpoint, as we think about forecasting returns the next 10 years, what this chart is telling you is that the returns are forecasted to be between zero and 5% for stocks. So stocks, potential forecasted rate of return on average, the next 10 years is between zero and, and 5%. Vanguard is suggesting that the forecast to return for U.S. growth is 0.1%, so basically not making any money. And for large cap value, it's 4.1%. So somewhere under 4, 5%, like I said before, is the forecast return going forward. So when you think about that statistic and what that means to you specifically, and this is why I tell people all the time, I tell people all the time, you need a financial plan. And they say, well, why do I need the financial plan? Many people have gone through life without a financial plan. And I agree with that, with that statement. However, when you have a financial plan, the difference is, is you're, you have the ability now to really optimize your wealth, right? You have the ability to optimize your wealth because you're spending the time to take a look at where you stand today, where markets are at, what your vision is, what you need to do. And because you're spending the time doing that, it gives you the higher probability of optimizing your wealth over time. And that's why the financial plan is important, number one. But even more important, number two, in this type of environment we're in right now, a lot of prospective clients that come to me, their advisors have used rates of return like 6%, 7%, and 8% to prove to them that they have enough money today to live on during retirement. What I've always done with clients, which I think is important, and even now more than ever because of what I'm proving right here, is you need to plan using 3% rate of returns going forward. Right. So look at where you are today. So, so what is your vision for your life? What does that cost? How much assets you have? Let's use a 3% average calculation to see if you could still achieve your vision for the rest of your life at a 3% rate of return. I'm not suggesting you're going to get 3% rate of return. What I'm suggesting is that no advisor out there can tell you exactly what the returns are going to be over the next 10 and 20 years. So that's why it's really important to me when I sit down with clients, I say to them, I want to prove to you using a conservative rate of return that you could accomplish your goals. Because when you leave my office, you're getting in your car and you're driving, living your life. I want you to have confidence and conviction that, gosh, I'm really in the right place. I saved enough money. I, I used a 3% rate of return. I think, I think that I can produce better returns than that, but I tried it using conservative returns and I'm still in a great place. And I proved that, and you prove that through planning. You also want to utilize higher inflation expectations. You don't want to use history, right? Because that dynamic now may have shifted. So that's where you want to use in higher inflation data to see if your portfolio still holds up in terms of not running out of money, which I'm going to talk more about that in another webinar. So this last section, the importance of this last section is, is really helping you understand 
that based on we're trading today, going forward returns are going to be lower than what we had what we had before. And, it's, and if that is the case, how did, how is that going to affect your overall plan? Because if you look at sequence of returns, which is the slide before this, what this shows you in, is, is an example of if you retired, for example, 1973 here, and you started with weak returns, you run out of money a lot quicker versus if you started when you if you if you retire and you get strong returns going forward the outcome is much greater so we can't control when you retire or stop working uh, what the returns going to be going forward but now more than ever is is really important to be tactical versus passive within your overall portfolio and I, the way i like to always show this what i mean by that specifically is, is you can't just you can't just sit and buy an index fund anymore going forward because of these forecast rate of returns. The importance of, of when you're balancing a portfolio, and I talk about this quite often, in, in my, especially in my weekly writings, if you have a portfolio that is truly diversified, which means bonds, stocks, commodities, and gold, and you're fully invested, and the rest, you have the rest in cash is to pay, to pay for your 12 months worth of expenses or any other expenses that you have coming up under three years. The rest gets fully invested. And then what you do on an ongoing basis is you watch the portfolio. If stocks go down, that means that bonds should go up and gold historically has gone up. So now you have something to sell to take advantage of stocks going down. And by doing that consistently over a 10 year period, you should return more than what the CAPE ratio is forecasting going forward. So that's why being tactical and being active in your portfolio going forward is going to be really important to getting quality returns as we think about things. And then lastly, The point I want to show here is the stock market. Every single year, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. The average return, at, the average correction where the market goes, get when the market hits a high point and then goes down, the average correction in any given year going back, this goes back 30, 42 years, the average correction is 14%. So anytime you start a new year, you know that there is a high probability that the market can correct 14%. So that's why rebalancing the portfolio when that happens is important to, to obtain returns. But even more important to that, to that is, is when you know and understand that going forward, something is going to happen based on, based on past data, you have no surprises. When you have no surprises, it keeps your emotions in check. When I talk about clients about not time in the market, when I write about it all the time, when you take somebody here, an investor from, from 2001 to 2020, stocks, if $1 grew to $4.22. If you miss the best 14 months because you got emotional and scared, your return goes to $1.27. So fully invested, $4. Time in the market, getting scared, $1.27. So so not time in the market is really critical to your success in terms of investing, rebalancing a portfolio is truly in, important in terms of investing. And then finally, in, with the start of the year, it's a great opportunity for you to get organized, to really understand where all your financial matters are, all your documents, put it together in one single plan. We put together what's called a PWM one plan, which is new to the firm. It's a way for our clients to organize all their financial matters, estate planning, tax documents, insurance documents, deeds to your home, your financial plan, taxes, all in one single document. So when you have a question about what insurance coverage I have, or do I have any forward tax forward uh, tax loss, do I have any tax losses going forward within my overall tax returns? You take the book, you open it up move to that chapter and you have the answer to any questions that you have. This is also encrypted in, in, uh, in a vault that we have to simplify and organize your life, which creates that peace of mind. So in an environment we're in today where, where markets may be more volatile than normal, lower forecasted returns, now is a time more than ever to put together a detailed financial plan if you haven't done already, if you're a client of mine, 
and put together a plan, get yourself organized, simplify your life and always be prepared for the worst, which is important. So I'm right at the time that I want to be at, which is 1233. So if anyone has any questions, now is a good time to ask them. The question here is, great presentation, still the Fed is already behind the, yield, behind the curve. It has been politicized given the pandemic and, wor and worries about employment. Generally, real interest rates are negatively correlated with the price of gold, i.e. rising real rates adversely impact the yellow metal. Thus, when the Fed gets, uh, gets us out of the negative real interest rate environment, being in gold is not the best solution. The investor needs a security fund negatively correlated to rising rates to reduce duration. So, George, thank you for your question. When you look back at history of gold and interest rates, the actual correlation is zero. It's not negative. So there are periods, yes, when and there is where interest rates go up and gold goes down, but there's also periods where the opposite, where the interest rates go up and gold went up with, with, with interest rates. If you look at gold today, it is strengthening relative to other asset classes, right? And there is there has been a lag last year, mainly due to the dollar strengthening. You saw gold, you saw uh, you saw gold was down 2.4% last year. I think that dynamic shifts, especially if inflation's here for the longer term. But I appreciate the question. In terms of the Fed and what you said, 100% the Fed's behind the yield curve. I don't know what the Fed was possibly thinking, especially with all those small people at the table. The reality is, is that we were in, inflation was never transitory. And the biggest issue today is the gap between the high income earners, the low income earners, which is a big concern of the Federal Reserve, but, not in, but that's not their job to fix that problem. But they have talked about it. That's a, that's a concern of the White House, which is a main concern. So if you have inflation rising, guess who that really affects? That affects the low income household more than anybody, right? So this is something that the Fed has to get now, get ahead of that, so that doesn't happen. As far as politicized, I think that's really interesting. That's why I think maybe the first half, he moves a lot quicker than the second half. So it doesn't look like he's being political in the moves that he's making, because with the 22 midterm elections coming about, if inflation is a problem and COVID continues to be a problem, and the many of the the low income earners that may be voted for for Democratic this time around may have a challenge doing that going forward. And I think the, the Democratic Party doesn't want to lose their seats. Right. So I think they're going to try to do all they can to try to tame that. So it should be interesting to watch. They're supposed to be independent. Uh, I think, unfortunately, that's not the case anymore. Should one have rented real estate? I have no problem with renting real estate. I really don't. I think that the home you live in is okay to rent because it's nothing more than an actual expense. If you're not going to rent it, I really do believe you should maximize the amount you borrow, especially at rates that where they are today, right? You take the rates to where they are today, I call it two, 3%, somewhere around there. If you factor in your deduction you get and you factor in investing your money in a balanced portfolio that can yield you five, six or 7%, your, your, your arbitrage you get from that over the next 20 years will help build your wealth and grow your wealth, right? A home that you live in is nothing but a, uh, a, a money pit and, and a complete expense. When you factor in how much money you put into your home every year, taxes you pay, mortgages, many people say, hey, I bought a house for 200 now, it's worth 800,000. When you factor in everything I just said, you really don't make any money at all. It maybe averaged one or 2%. So your home that you live in is not a good investment. What areas of the market do you like now? So areas that I like right now specifically is I do believe Omicron is gonna be, uh, it's gonna start to peak out over the next week or two. I think fortunately we're starting to see you know cases go up, but that's really it's been pretty steady, thank God. Um, so because of that, I do think next two to three months to four months, you're going to start people really getting out there and spend money on services. You know, last year in 21 was a year where consumers spent money on durable goods such as appliances and, and TVs, etc., and services were muted because nobody wanted to go out and travel and so forth. So coming in 22, I think what we're going to see is the opposite. We're going to see people spend money on services. And, and which means people get on airplanes, go to hotels and things like that. So we started buying into JETS, which is JTS, which is an ETF, which is, uh, gives us exposure to the airline industry. So I do think you could start moving into the cyclical parts or the reopening stocks within, uh, within the economy and make some money in markets here in the short term. As far as the tech sell off, I think there's, there's a talk about strong correlation to rising rates, rising rates. When rates rise, there's a strict correlation or negative correlation with technology going down. Until the Fed is done, technology sell-off is not going to be done. We're going to get some dead cat bounces like we're seeing right now. But overall, 
um, very bearish on, especially the most speculative part of the technology area. To complete an overall plan takes two weeks. I think earnings are gonna to continue to remain strong as long as the economy remains strong, which I think is the case looking at the data. So I am optimistic that earnings in the fourth quarter, earnings in the first quarter, I definitely think we peaked in 21, but that's more base effect, but now we're gonna to start to decline from there. But overall, I feel pretty good about the economy and I feel, I feel pretty good about markets return in 2022. I think we can be over, uh, get a return of over 10%, but volatility will be heightened. I wouldn't be surprised in the first half of this year we see a correction north of 10%. So that means volatility will pick up, will pick up because of the Fed and everything the Fed is doing. But ultimately, I do think we're in pretty good shape. So real estate investment trust versus bonds. So as a team, we've been really hitting it hard to sit back and really understand, hey, do we want to position REITs within our clients' portfolios? And for us, it was more of a valuation play. If you think about real estate today, any real estate that you buy today, the cap ratios are under 5%. If you're lucky, you get something over maybe 5.5%. Those cap rates are really, really low, which shows me those valuations are stretched. What we, what we are doing as a firm is we are ready to pull the trigger in REITs when there's an opportunity to do so. Um, right now, we just we prefer some volatility. We prefer some uh, a correction in, in the real estate area before we take a position. But once we do, to answer your question, um, Monica, we would definitely be taking a position and we could get some good cash flows in doing that. We're just a little bit concerned based on where we are from a valuation perspective. There's a lot of capital flowing that way. And anytime there's money flowing one way, we want to get away from that. That's really important to us. So, so that's uh, so we are interested in that in that asset class. It would be additive to what we're doing, like I showed you before. But right now, we're staying status quo. Bitcoin, in my view, is not better than gold. Bitcoin is moving like technology stocks. Bitcoin is speculation, like these high multiple stocks that we saw sell off thirty to eighty percent, and I see Bitcoin off fifty percent. Bitcoin is pure speculation. That we don't know exactly how it's going to play out. The government can stroke its pen and, and next thing you know, it's down 50%, 60% or greater from here. Um, I don't think Bitcoin is going away. I like the idea of Bitcoin and Ethereum within portfolios, one to 3%. I have not initiated that within clients. One thing I've been talking to them about is if we, I believe we get more of a correction here in the cryptocurrency. And with that, I'd be interested in taking a position, but I do not think Bitcoin is better than gold. Gold is separate to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not is not the same type of asset class, if you want to call it that, than gold. So in terms of make, getting a plan done, yeah. So we have a, a process for everything, right? So I really believe everybody can have all the goals they want, but if you have no process to get there, it doesn't matter. So we have a process in putting together a specific financial plan for clients. And we have a goal to make things as easy as possible for you. I say, if you go to my website, listen to my videos, when I created the video, it was important for me to convey to you, to take the burden of you managing your money off your shoulders and put it on our shoulders so you can go out there and live the very best life possible. So when it comes to building a financial plan for you, it's definitely important for us to make the process as simple and streamlined as easy and easy as, po as possible for you. And uh, we walk you through those exact processes and how to actually do that. Yeah, so if you want to set up a, a meeting with me, you can just go to my website. My calendar is on my website. You can call my office, schedule a, a, a meeting with or Zoom meeting or in-person meeting, whatever's best for you with one of my teammates. Um, that's, that's not a problem at all. All right, so we're a little bit past how far I wanted to go, but so I just want to just finish off just very, very quickly. One of the goals I have as a firm is to convey content to you that is straightforward, no nonsense, tell you exactly what's going on, how I feel about it, and what you should be doing about it. That's really important. So if you watch me on, if you watch me on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, right, all my messages and videos I'm, I create is to help you understand exactly what's going on and be straightforward. That's really important to us. So you can count on that type of content going forward. We will have another webinar about planning and the importance of planning and not running out of money. So stay tuned for that. So thank you all very much for, for being here today. Um, it was great presenting in front of all of you. These are all great 
concerns and issues you know, that, that we can debate about. So any other questions you have, you can reach out to me at any time. So enjoy your day, enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your week.